Hi, I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist and, of course, host of Star Talk. For this episode, we're doing something we've never done before and might not ever do it again. Uh, first, you might not know that we have a Patreon page where you can support what we do. And when you become a Patreon member, basically become a patron of Star Talk, you give us the latitude to experiment in many different ways of bringing science down to earth. That's in part why we have so many different vehicles to do this. So many different kinds of programming that initially sponsors don't, they're a little afraid of it. They don't know if it'll work. And so they tend to be more conservative about the risks than we want to be. So Patreon support enables us, empowers us to take those risks. Well, in this new tiering system, the entry level is $5 a month. And it Last I checked, I don't think you can get out of Starbucks without dropping $5. So, but who am I to tell you how to spend your money? All right. But for $5, what you do is you get to ask exclusive questions about the universe of me or experts I bring in to address those topics. And these are exclusive sessions only for Patreon members. It's a cosmic queries just for you. And what we're going to do this time is give you a taste of what that has been at just at that entry level. There are other perks at other higher levels. Some are fun and interesting and educational. And there's one category where I autograph books and I send them to you. You know, there's all, you can check it out. Okay. But for this episode, what we've done is getting the best of the Patreon Cosmic Queries. And we put them together, and I'm there fielding those questions with my comedic co-host, Chuck Nice. He reads me the questions. I've never seen the questions before he reads them. And we just have a fun time riffing on what we know and what we don't know about the universe. And so for this episode, it is basically our greatest hits. And anyone can listen to this episode Previously, it was only available behind the paywall. And so now you'll get a taste of what will still live behind the paywall. And these are exclusive questions and answers for Patreon members at that base level of $5 a month. So let us begin. Here I am with Chuck Nice with the greatest hits of Patreon Cosmic Queries. Check it out. All right, here we go. This is uh, Bruno Faria, who says, hello, Dr. Neil and Chuck. I'm Bruno from Brazil. My question is, um, the space is in constant growth. Does that matter like planets and for us, like the space between our molecules or the space between Atoms. Ooh, ooh, he's getting, ooh, 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 ooh. Bruno, thanks for that question. So first of all, right now, the expansion of space is not strong enough on the scales of solar systems and planets and moons for that stretching to manifest, okay, mm. to reveal itself. So, but as this continues, what will happen is the stretching power of the expanding universe will begin to manifest on solar system scales and planets will get separated from their host stars and fly off into oblivion. Then eventually, so it, it will begin to overcome the gravity that's going on in tight quarters. Then it'll begin to overcome the electromagnetic forces and it'll start separating atoms in the molecules that they were once made of. Then that'll continue and then start interfering with the strong nuclear force and then start separating atoms. And as that continues in 10 to the 20, no, in 20 billion years, if the stretching goes unchecked, it will reach a point where it will want to stretch the very fabric of what can what comprises the space-time continuum. Oh, shoot. The, the pixels, the 3D pixels that construct the universe in which we live, it'll come a point where those pixels cannot even hold together and it wants to stretch those, but you can't stretch it any more than you can stretch a fabric beyond a particular point. And that, what happens at that point, Chuck? The big rip, baby! It's the big rip. It's the big rip. So, Bruno, yeah. you just described the big rip. You, you just you just laid the seeds of the big rip as this stretching force 
the, this, this, it's basically dark energy, which yeah. continues to overcome these other forces that are trying to make life possible. Uh -huh. And yeah, if that goes unchecked, that's, that's the end period. And I lose sleep over what that even looks like, what that would be like. Yeah. Ooh. Well, by the way, that was a painterly and eloquent description. And I love the 3D pixels of the universe. That is brilliant. I don't know what else to call them, but that's what they are. And oh, they, it, it's called a Planck length. It's called, yeah. named after Max Planck. Well, that's, basically that's, the, yeah, I've, I've now Planck, Planck length I've heard, but 3D mm -hmm. pixels of the universe, that's, mwah, that's beautiful. I love that. All right. All right. Here we go. Let's go. Matthew Power. Oh, mm -hmm. Oh, he's like a secret agent. Um, dear Neil and Chuck, what's up? Why does our solar system and many galaxies seem to be disc-like and not atom-like with orbiting objects going around in all manner of ways? Oh, wow, look that, at that. A person been thinking about this yeah, situation. Because, yeah, because it's like... An uh, atom has like a round nucleus, so to speak. Well, well our traditional representation of an atom, it's right. got, you know, the orbits in every angle. So the, every let angle. me use that as his iconographic reference Yes. Uh, to, to the atom. So a uh, couple, at first it's a brilliant question. It pre perplexed people for centuries. And the first indication that maybe we were onto something was in the mid-1700s, like okay. the literal exact mid-1700s, 1750. Two people independently, Laplace, a mathematician, mm -hmm. and uh, the philosopher, uh, what's the dude's name? It'll come to me in a minute. Uh, they both came up with what today we call the nebular hypo hypothesis. Okay, Kant, Immanuel Kant. Oh, and existentialist. Laplace. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, uh, so he did this on the side, and Laplace sort of figured this out because he knew some physics. But what they were imagining was that if you had a gas cloud, because there's gas all over the galaxy. And if that's what you make stuff out of, right, how might that happen? So if a gas is kind of rarefied and thin, so you got to sort of collapse it so that it can become solid stuff, okay? So as the gas cloud, cloud begins to collapse, what they knew was that however slowly it's rotating as a large gas cloud, Mm -hmm. As it gets smaller, it will rotate faster. Gotcha. Just like the ice skater who brings in the arms. Right. They begin to rotate faster. Okay. Well, as you rotate faster, there's this centrifugal force that prevents things from continuing to collapse in that disk direction. Because that's where the centrifugal forces are preventing it. But if you come in from the top and bottom... They no centrifugal force preventing you. So yes. you collapse like a pancake, keeping the flat shape. And this would be a very natural thing to happen in the universe. And sure enough, that's how you get flat galaxies. And our galaxy is flat. Sp other spiral galaxies are flat. And they're really flat. And they say, how flat are they? How flat are they? Thank you for asking that. Uh, so are they as flat as a pancake? No, they're flatter. Flat as a crepe? They're like a crepe or or tor tortilla. Yes. Ooh, <laughs> you want to be French or you want to be uh, uh, right, Mexican. Mexican. <laughs> yeah. So they're, uh, the, our Milky Way is about 100 times as wide as uh, across as it is thick. And that's way thinner than a pancake. Yeah, that's it, paper. Thin. That's, that's practically paper. Right. So, so you get these shapes when that happens. So it happens to the galaxy. It happens to... The solar system within the galaxy, right? right? So this is a very natural phenomenon. Now, let's say you don't participate in that collapse. Okay. You're so far away, you don't care what anybody close up is doing. Mm -hmm. Well, you still might form things, but you're not going to be in a disk. Oh, my gosh. Let's look far out in our galaxy. There's what we call the Oort cloud of comets. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not a literal cloud of, of, of diffuse matter. It's just it's comets filling a space that completely surrounds the sun. And so we call that a cloud rather than a belt, because belts are flat, like the asteroid belt, right. the Kuiper belt. Right. These are belts that are flat, and they go around the sun in the plane of the solar system. You go far enough out, th so those comets come in from every which way around the, the solar system. So they do represent a spherical uh, uh, distribution of, of, of icy bodies. 
It, wow. Comets, they come from the Oort <laughs> cloud. And they're very long periods, like the hundreds, the tens and hundreds of thousands of years, because it's very far out for them to make their complete loop. And so, so it's a great question. It and we, great we, question. we think we got that one solved. And so by the way, all discs are made that way. So the, uh, what are called accretion discs, the discs that form around black holes. Black holes. Yeah, yeah, it's a general phenomenon in the galaxy. So let me ask you this then. Oh, by the way, and people in their middle age who gain weight around their belt, uh -huh. we, in my field, we would right. joke and say, you have an accretion disc. <laughs> well, that sounds a lot better than a uh, beer a pot belly. belly. Beer belly, yeah. pot belly. Yeah, right. yeah. I have well, an accretion disc. I have an accretion disc. Yes. yes. No, mm -hmm. you're fat. <laughs> um, right. So the spinning can happen in any direction first to create the flat because- There's going to be one, that's a great question. There's going to be one orientation that dominates. That's what okay? I'm saying. Cause, yeah. cause, because the cloud cannot spin in all directions at once. Right. Because it would, it, it would collide with itself like two right. marshmallows, hot marshmallows hitting. They collide and attach. And so that stuff settles out and it finds the dominant axis around which to rotate. So is that why you can look out and see galaxies in different positions? Yeah, so the, so the, the spiral galaxies can be face on, edge right. on, and you get to see all of, no, no, that, no, they'll form wherever their gas cloud, their native gas cloud, whatever that orientation was. But now That's here's something, suppose you formed stuff, suppose you formed your stars before the gas collapsed to the middle. Well, wait a minute then, you're not gonna get a disc. Right. Because they'll orbit around a center, but they're not going to collapse and stick to itself. So we, such a galaxy does exist. They're called elliptical galaxies. These are fully sort of puffed up, three-dimensional right. spherical uh, elliptical shapes. And they have very low gas. There was no gas making that disc happen. Well, so we know- They must be lovely at a party. <laughs> gas free. <laughs> so, so we know that the planets of the solar system all formed after the gas of the solar system had collapsed, wow! The Kuiper, the 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 Oort cloud of comets, those formed after, okay, and they did not form out of, uh, they did not require the collapsing gas cloud to form, and so they're still in their in their atomic orbits around the sun. So it's a great question. So Andrea or Andrea Sperini says this: Hello, Neil and Chuck. If I were an astronaut floating in intergalactic space, and I could remove all matter from the visible universe. Where would I be? And <laughs> what would my eyes be able to see if the boundaries of the universe would wrap around my body? Wow. Thanks for accompanying me on my long walks with your podcast. <laughs> my long walks to the edge of the universe. <laughs> yeah, don't walk too far. Yeah, don't walk too far, girl. <laughs> Fall up. <laughs> Talking about where would you be with no matter at all. <laughs> so... Generally, where you are only has meaning in reference to something else, right? So there's an interesting philosophical dilemma, right? So if I, we, are a certain number of degrees west of the Greenwich Prime Meridian, and we're a certain number of degrees north of the equator, all right? So we're basically like 74 degrees west, 41 degrees north. That, so that's where we are on Earth's surface relative to a coordinates that have been pre-established, okay? But then where are those coordinates, all right? So, so the prime meridian is like zero. And so, so where are those in relationship to anything else? We can say that there's 74 degrees east of us, but that would make us the preeminent prime you know, establisher of the coordinate system, but we know we're not. So at some point, you have to arbitrarily declare the coordinate system and then reference everything else to it. And everyone then has to agree that you've done that. Otherwise, people don't know where they are relative to each other. All right. You, you, you know where you are relative to some grid that you set up in your backyard and somebody else set up some other grid and you will never communicate accurately uh, with each other or productively. So everybody's got to agree. So the prime meridian was established by international agreement. Okay, to go through. And by the way, it almost went through Paris, the Paris Observatory. Uh, France was bucking for the prime meridian back when it was up for grabs, and uh, England won out. Uh, it's rumored that France conceded the prime meridian 
uh, in exchange for everybody adopting the metric system. <laughs> so, because they came up with the metric system. Well, so, this is the quid bad, pro quo. <laughs> yeah, the quid pro quo of historical science and metrics. But anyhow, so if you are if you are between galaxies, and galaxies are the things that dot the observable universe, and then you start removing the galaxies, yet you have no coordinate system. But what you will know, because we kind of know this, is that you are still nonetheless in the center of your own horizon. But you can't see the edge of your horizon because there's nothing to allow you to measure it. So, and by the way, we think of horizons as two dimensions, like right. out at sea, but in space, your horizon is all around you right. in every direction. So it's a spherical horizon. Well, that's and by the way, Wow, yeah, it's, conf so it's confusing. That's got to be disorienting. Now, you want to talk about your wife getting mad because you don't ask for directions. <laughs> now you can get lost in all three dimensions. Right, now you're lost in all directions at once. <laughs> Am I up, down, left, right, north, south, forward, backwards? Uh, so, well, so yeah, you have... Alpha Centauri. Never. <laughs> well, so, just... yeah, so you, there's no, there's, if there's no coordinate system established... Uh, it doesn't make sense to say where you are, other than to say you're at the center of your own horizon, which isn't very helpful. But then again, do you really need to know where you are if there's no place to go? Oh, snap. Look at that. That has, been, the, my, the, that has <laughs> been my life for an entire year now. <laughs> no place to go. That's been my whole life for a year now. I, I don't care where my current coordinates are because I have no coordinates I need to visit. That's it. That's a I'm, profound. I'm not going anywhere. That's the problem. But wow. even if you were, you're not hit. Even if you pick a direction, you're not headed anywhere. That's right. Right. Yeah. Because there's no place waiting for you. It's all been removed from the universe by Andrea. <laughs> Andrea yeah. Andrea, I got to tell you, this got really sad very quickly. <laughs> got sad fast. This got sad fast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, but it is true. If you're navigating within the galaxy, you're not going to be using GPS on Earth. So we're thinking in the future, as we move throughout the Milky Way, we would set up a grid system targeting pulsars that are scattered because they're very fast rotating. And they send right. radio pulses in for having rotated. In, in their configuration, and that gives you a place to look, and you can get a timing system based on that, and a system of locations within the galaxy, much like GPS on Earth. So Pulsar GPS is going to be the future of space travel. Wow. That's yeah. cool. All right, let's get more questions. We're going to take a quick break, but when we return, we will continue to dig in deep to our Patreon-exclusive question and answer archive with Chuck Nice. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back to Star Talk. This episode is a collection of cosmic queries asked by our Patreon patrons. We reached back into the archives of our monthly Patreon-only episodes to find some of our favorite moments of questions and answers to share with you. So let's find out what Chuck asks me next, fed to us by our Patreon members. Yeah, well, let's start at the top here. This is Denny. Denny is saying, greetings from Germany. Um, it says, I wonder why so many people believe the aliens will fly in a disc-shaped ship. Is there any physical advantage in building aircrafts in that shape? No. Next question. <laughs> 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 it's like, no, right? no. Yeah, we, we've got this trope in our head, right? right. And, and once, it, once the seed gets planted, it's kind of hard to shake it. And so, so I, I remember, do you remember uh, the show Lost in Space? Of course. Okay, I think we talked about this once where, you know, these, these spacecraft only sort of levitate when they rotate, right? Right. They're, like they're rotating disks. Right. But there they are on the ship, looking out a window at the same destination, even though the whole thing is rotating. That very much disturbed me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so basically- Why is lost... everything just whizzing by left and right? And so, yeah, it just doesn't, there's, I mean, yes, a disc has nice aerodynamics, okay, but uh, most of a journey through space has no air, so it doesn't right. have to be aerodynamic at all, really. 
Uh, so there's a lot of there's a lot of problems with that shape. That's uh, why my everything. favorite my favorite spaceship um, in all of sci-fi is the Borg ship from uh, Star Trek, uh, which is a giant cube, the oh, least aerodynamic uh, thing. There ever. it is. There they said, you know, we got this. We yep. don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need to be sleek. Yep. We don't need to be. But in that same vein, the Enterprise didn't have to be that aerodynamic looking, right? Because yeah. it was never in the atmosphere. It was always right. out, out, in the, out in the empty space. Yeah, yeah, so that's a great question. And I've in my whole life, I have not found any legitimate aerodynamic reason or any other reason to design a ship that way. By the way, there's a little bit of physics that people don't, you know, if you're just making up stories, you typically miss it. If you are in f open space and you set something rotating in one direction, uh -huh. something has to go rotating in the exact opposite way to counterbalance that. So in other words, if it starts not rotating and then begins to rotate, something inside of it has to rotate the opposite way to cancel out what's called the angular momentum. If you have a flying saucer that's just there, floating, it has zero rotational angular momentum, okay? Mm -hmm. I, I was just redundant there. Zero angular, angular momentum. momentum. Okay, zero. So if any part of it starts rotating in one direction, some part of it has to rotate the opposite way to cancel out the angular momentum. Because you can't just set yourself into, mo into rotational right. motion. Right. Unless you have rocket, little rocket vectors. Right, then it, that, right. Yeah, and, and then you're, you're spewing out gases in one direction, and that's the maintains the momentum. So to see these, these, these in all these sci-fi things, they just rotate. No, right. it's violating deep laws of physics. Laws of wow. physics that no alien is going to circumvent. And the funny thing is you see them rotating, and like you say, there's, if there's zero reason for it whatsoever. <laughs> uh, <laughs> There's absolutely no reason for it. I mean, imagine an air, imagine a seven forty seven say, "Okay, we're gonna start rotating now." It's right like, for what? For what? <laughs> it's like like you don't fly and barrel roll your way uh, over to Europe. <laughs> Exactly. You, you know, there's no reason to barrel roll the plane the entire way you're going to Europe. It's stupid. Uh, exactly. Exactly. So wow. Anyhow. All right, that was cool, man. Yeah, great question. I'll Here do we quick. go. Watch this. Yeah. Watch this. Uh, this is Elaine in the Stars says, hey, Dr. Tyson, Lord Nice, can a moon have a moon? Ooh, I, I, I like the, I just love the whole, you know, positioning of that. Can a moon have a moon? Yes. Ooh, yes. You sound very skeptical when you say that. Your yes. Your yes is very suspect, what? Neil. You got, it's got to be very zonal, okay? Uh -huh. So the first moon has to be far enough away from the main planet so that the moon around the moon, when it orbits around, is not badly affected when it's on the near side compared to the far side. Right. Okay? You got to make sure your orbits can stabilize out because right. orbital allegiance can get very complicated. If you have three objects, okay, it's called the three-body problem. Right. And it's very, it's it's basically chaotic, the three-body problem, except in very restricted cases. So, so in other words, the sun, earth, and moon mm -hmm. is a three-body problem. But we're so far the hell away from the sun that our moon can hang out here without thinking, oh my gosh, now I have to go hang out and orbit the sun. Right? Right. It doesn't have orbital allegiance problems. Right. If earth were orbiting much closer to the sun, Right. Then the moon, as it comes around the backside or the front side, will say, hey, right. the sun is tugging me more than you are, Earth. That's right. I'm going to go that way. And then right. it, it destabilizes everything. So the consequences of destabilized orbits is you'll fall into the sun or you'll fall into the main planet or you'll get ejected forever. We okay. think the solar system started with at least 30 planets when it originally formed. And it was just a jockeying for st stable orbits. And not everybody wins that that contest. Mm -hmm. So like there you most, go, planets. Most lose. 
Yeah. Here you go. What you won't do for your moon, some other planet's gravity <laughs> will. It's going to take it, take it off. Just better remember that. <laughs> girl, you going to let him treat you like that, girl? You going to let him treat you like that? <laughs> Wait, come back. No, come I'm here. switching, I'm switching my here. allegiance. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so moons can have moons and in okay. the same way if you think of earth as a moon to the sun we have a moon you, okay. know, you can think about it that way so but it's so really the th three body problem there you go yeah and orbits tend to be highly unstable so and by the way you can invert that and say uh you can have double star systems such as what was portrayed in the first of the star wars movies which is, of course, Star Wars Episode Four. Okay, <laughs> and he walks out. He's on the sand planet or whatever, and he sees a double sunset. All right, that's that's the only accurate science in the entire Star Wars series. <laughs> Soundtrack by Chuck Nice. <laughs> I feel I felt like you needed a little a little Star Wars music bed for that. <laughs> Every, that's an iconic scene, by the way. Here we go. A long time ago, <laughs> in a galaxy far, <laughs> far, far away. Far away. No, so in other words, those two stars are orbiting close to each other. Right. And the planet is orbiting much farther away. Right. So that's the inversion of this problem. You can have two main bodies. Right. But they have to be far away and close to each other. So that as you orbit them, you don't know that one is closer to you than the other because they're sort of, it's a smoothed out sort of gravity field. But the moment those two stars are far apart or you orbit close to them, forget it. You're in an unstable situation. There you go. Awesome. There we go. Let's go to TJ Monroe. TJ says this, Dr. Tyson. Now, this is TJ speaking here. Okay. I ain't got nothing to do with this. <laughs> You're right? pre-disassociating yourself. I, I am pre-disassociating, okay? All right. Uh, Dr. Tyson, the f*** is a graviton. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thanks, TJ. Okay. Graviton is a proposed quantum particle of gravity. They have yet to be uh, detected. So, it's is is it a graviton is to gravity gravitational waves what a photon is to light waves. Wow. All right. So, we we think of light as waves and it moves through space. Right. And that's fine. Okay, and you can measure them as waves depending on your apparatus, but you can also measure it as photons, right? provided you have the right apparatus. And when you do, you have concluded and demonstrated that light behaves both as a particle, and as a wave, and as a particle, both of them, okay? We have already measured gravitational waves, all right, uh, from colliding black holes, the LIGO observatory, laser interferometer gravitational observatory, that measured waves. So do we have an apparatus yet that can measure the quantum particle that gravity represents? And we don't. But we're not given reason to think it wouldn't exist. So it's out there. It's dangling above our heads. Maybe it doesn't exist. And if it doesn't, that would be interesting too. So the graviton is the force propagator of gravity in the way that the photon is the force propagator of electromagnetic energy, in the way that the gluon is the force propagator of the strong force. And in the way the intermediate vector boson is the, is, the, <laughs> is the force propagator of the weak force. So all four forces have an, uh, an on. Photon, boson. Um, gluon. Gluon and a, and a graviton. Mm -hmm. There it is. There you go. Simple. So, <laughs> there you go. There you have it. So add that to your stick on. And <laughs> hopefully that clears some things up for you. <laughs> All right. All right. Here we go. This is Kevin the Semelier, who uh, is also a friend. If you weren't the director of the Kevin, hate recommend a wine next time. We told you this. That's right, if Kevin. You're gonna, uh, you're you didn't do put it. A question and call yourself a sommelier. If you don't recommend a wine, you know, I don't know. We have to part ways, okay? Okay, there okay. you go, Kevin. The gauntlet has been thrown down. You must recommend <laughs> okay. a mine next time. All right, okay. next time. Kevin says this, if you weren't the director of the Hayden Planetarium, what do you think you would be doing? Oh. 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 And this is oh. a question to a man 
who knew when he was like nine years old that he was going to be an astrophysicist. So that's a damn good question. Okay, so I have a cop-out answer, and that is, if I didn't spend so much time thinking about how other people learn and how they think and what brings joy to them about the universe, I would just be an astrophysicist unheard of in a lab somewhere. And you would never know my name because no one would come to me for sound bites. No, you don't get news. to do that. No, yeah, that's no. yes. Let me let me. No. Okay. okay, you fine. can't fine. be an astrophysicist still. Okay, okay. you gotta okay. pick oh, fine. something fine. else. Fine. Fine. Okay, he said he said director of the planetarium. This is true. What, what else would I be? And I said right. I'd be a, I'd be hidden in a lab somewhere. But right. you still be but an if, astrophysicist, which yes, means I would. That's yeah. not what he asked. Yeah, right. I know right. he didn't ask that, fine. but fine. Fine, fine. Go ahead. Okay, you know what I'd do? Okay. What? It, but this had to be another universe. It wouldn't right. happen in this universe. Okay. Uh, I'd be I'd be a, a, a songwriter for Broadway musicals. Ooh, now there we go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because I love putting word to page and putting a rhyme that's simple and two people fall in love and they're so, com- they're, they're so overrun by that emotion that they have to stop and sing a song about it. Oh my right? God, I can see the, it the, now. The, the night sky that. by Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> Don't you love the night sky? <laughs> <laughs> No, the reason why they have to be in another universe is because I don't know how to sing and I don't know how to write music. Okay. So that's a that's a whole other universe, a parallel a parallel verse. That's cool. That I'd have to do that in. But right. uh, thanks for that question, Mr. Sommelier. We're going to take another quick break, but when we return, more Patreon only cosmic queries that have never before been posted beyond the exclusive Patreon page. Welcome back to the special edition of Cosmic Queries. And before we bring you to the third and final segment, let me just remind you that these Cosmic Queries were mined from years of Patreon exclusive content that were Cosmic Queries sent in by them and answered and kept behind a paywall for their own access. And we are bringing that across the divide so you can get a taste of what an entry-level Patreon membership will bring you at $5 a month. So, picking up on the greatest hits of Cosmic Queries, here's Chuck and me doing our best to answer some of the coolest, craziest, wacky questions on the internet. Eric Vargas says this, Hey, Chuck, hey, Neil, just observing the stars in our galaxy, we know that most solar systems are binary. Could it have been possible in the early formation of our solar system that we used to have two suns and that our sun kicked out another star from our system like an evil twin or a wife kicking out a husband after an <laughs> argument? That is, like- in the, that is not in the man's question. <laughs> That is not. How the, did okay. you know that? <laughs> you, how the hell did you know that? Did I put that in there? That's okay, amazing. So Chuck, go back out to the front lawn and bring your clothes back in <laughs> and, your, and your stereo system. <laughs> I don't need to ha- know all your business. So, and, and also, could life have evolved on Earth if we did have two suns? Okay. So yeah. There so, you go. so let me let me sharpen what they said. Most stars in the night sky, when you take a telescope to them, will reveal more than one star. In mutual orbit. Right. So more than half the stars are double multiple star systems. Sweet. It turns out planetary orbits are not particularly stable under those conditions. And because their their gravitational allegiance gets challenged every time. Right. Are you too close to one or too right. far from the other? Come and on over here. No, come on over here. <laughs> exactly. Come on over here. No, exactly. come on over here. Exactly. And so so the you can get chaotic orbits and even unstable orbits and they'll fly away. So we expect the most stable systems of planets to be happily orbiting single stars. But it is possible to have two stars orbiting so close together mm-hmm. and you, the planet, orbiting far enough away mm-hmm. that th- there's a smeared common gravity between the two and you don't feel this competing allegiance. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you can construct a, a, a star system where that's the case. And that's what was in Star Wars, episode right. four. Um, right. The Great Hope or the Hope, the Hope, Diamond, what's the name of that? Yeah. The, the New Hope. The New Hope. The, the New Hope. The New Hope. A New Hope. The, the episode four, where Luke is out, as he's, he's in the sand planet, wherever, and there's a double sunset there. Yes. I want you to notice that those stars are not far apart from each other. That's They're right. near each other on the sky. Right. So that planet he was on can sustain a stable orbit around it. And you can evolve life and have everything that you would want and need. And that is the only correct science in all 
Star Wars movies combined. Damn, damn. Oh, I'm just saying. Uh, oh, that Don't get me started. Don't not get even me started. A, not even the bar scene. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the bar scene, but okay, other right. than that. <laughs> oh, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> uh, so there's nothing wrong with having two stars as long as you're not gravitationally disturbed by it. Um, not a problem at all. Sweet. And yeah, it'd be fun. You have double sunsets and you have two shadows, but often the other sun is filling in the shadow that would be made by one of the suns. So you're not going to have two distinct shadows um, uh, coming right. out from you the way you do on Broadway when you have two collimated beams of light you can get two distinct shadows there right. um, because the light is only going in one direction and you have a dark place and a light place around it right. in, uh, on, if it's two suns it's showing light everywhere right. so you're not going to get beautiful double set shadows but you get double sunsets those would be those are twice as romantic sweet okay this is Gabriella uh Dijkovs, I, I think they're making this crap up no. now. <laughs> D-I-J-K-H-O-F-F-Z. So, uh, Dijkov, Dijkov. Dijkov. Uh, okay. Hey, Gabriella, here's the deal. Um, <laughs> no, no, hi. call her Gabby. Call her Gabby. Just shorten yeah, the whole go. damn thing. <laughs> oh, by the way, I can't believe you said that because I just looked and she ends it. Thanks. Gabby. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> All right, she so goes, hey, Neil, Chuck, Happy New Year. What do we know about any plans for an Alpha Centauri-related expedition, manned or unmanned? Thanks. So just Gabby. to remind people, Alpha Centauri is the closest star system to the sun, mm -hmm. four light years away, right? Mm -hmm. four, so that's, that's in our backyard, cosmically so your, speaking. So All your right. answer is none. No, wait, wait. So four light years. <laughs> At the fastest we have ever sent a spaceship would take anywhere between 15 and 30,000 years to get there, okay. right. to get to the closest star system. And Alpha Centauri is visible primarily from the Southern Hemisphere. You can catch it if you go as far south as like Florida, I th if I remember its location, but it, everybody in the Southern Hemisphere can see it. It's a relatively bright star. It's bright because it's nearby more than because it's intrinsically bright. And notice I call it a star system. Um, it was named Alpha Centauri because it's the brightest star in the constellation Centaurus, okay? And so for many, not all, many constellations, we see the stars and you, you just, in the old days, today we would do it differently, but um, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Epsilon, this sort of thing. That's why Star Trek has, you know, Alpha Ceti 5 or something or whatever. There, there would be, Alpha Ceti would be the brightest star in the constellation Cetus, and five would be the fifth planet in that star system. So these are coding. So Star Trek was like first out of the box to try to create a lexicon for planets and planet types. But anyhow, so Alpha Centauri, we know, is a star system, okay? And so there's, it's a multiple star system. And the nearest star in that star system is called Proxima Centauri. Mm -hmm. I wonder why. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Is it proximal to us? Is it yeah. right? Right. Okay. So that star was recently discovered to have an exoplanet. And that's Proxima B. Okay. A would be the main star. We we letter them by all the objects in the system. Um, and A is the star, B is the, the planet. So Proxima B is an exoplanet. Uh, it's Earth size, sort of, you know? So so it we fortuitously, the nearest star system, the nearest star of the nearest star system has a planet that's Earth-like. So yeah, that'd be the first one we'd visit if we were to go anywhere. And uh, can you, we have to kind of live forever for that to happen. And you have to convince someone, would you like to spend 70,000 years of, or 30,000 years of living forever on a ship headed towards a planet we don't know anything about, all right? Mm. And and why would you, what and, and you or have make it a generational ship and you have babies and then twelve gener uh, what, what, uh, th a thousand generations later uh, they'll get there and they wonder why the hell they got sent in the first place <laughs> or just get or just invent light travel light speed travel oh light speed and travel take four four years and then it'll take four years correct or or invent warp speed travel and then you get there faster than light. Or, 15 minutes. Or, or invent wormholes and you just step through a portal and you come out right. on the other side a seconds later. So, nice. so yeah, so there's no plans because we don't know how to do anything faster than chemical rockets at the moment. There is this something called Project Starshot, 
which are these micro satellites. They're the size of a postage stamp. And you can cram all kinds of electronics on something that's small these days, like like um, radio transmissions and, and and gyroscopic stabilizers and and uh, power sources because you can have a little solar panel thing that all right. So there's a plan to have a boatload of these, launch them into space, have them open up a solar sail, a light sail. All right, now this is a little, it's like a sail. And then have a set of lasers from Earth beam to these sails and accelerate them towards Alpha Centauri. If you do the calculation right and the sails are large enough and the power of the laser is big enough, the lasers will impart an impulse into these craft. It will accelerate them to 20% the speed of light. Now, of course, okay. the farther away they get, the weaker is the light signal. So right. this, this is all factored in. But they'll get there at 20% the speed of light, which means they'll get there in 20 years, right? If you're one-fifth the speed of light and you're four right. light years away, do the math, it's right. 20 years, all right? So, and then they would beam signals back to us at the speed of light. That takes four years. So we could actually have an entire mission that unfolds over a 24-year period. And, but the problem is, you know, you can do that because they're very light, uh, you know, light as in they don't have much mass. Right. Whereas, you know, too, why can't we do that to people? Because you, <laughs> people weigh well, too much. <laughs> we just, no, we just sent a bunch of jockeys. <laughs> jockeys, sorry. Yeah, we just sent jockeys. <laughs> yeah, I think that to be even lighter, Chuck, than jockeys. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, right. I, I well, imagine jockeys like strapped to solar sails and then... <laughs> I think the jockey union would object, I, I, I think, but all right. Okay. You know, also our tiny people out there are coxswains for uh, rowing. The, the cox right. I used to row. Because so. they don't take up weight in the boat. Uh, yeah, I was, a, I was yeah. A, a heavyweight boat. So uh, I, it was called a heavyweight boat because I was 40 pounds lighter to row in it then than I am in this moment. But we, 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 all, we were all the biggest guys. You know, I was 6'2", 196 pounds, and I was one of the littlest guys on the boat. Um, I rode stroke, which is the person who sits right in front of the coxswain who can't see any other rowers. So if I can't see any other rowers, you have to do what I do. <laughs> because right. I, that's all they can look at. That's all they can look at, right. So, um, and the coxswain is, um, uh, you know, someone who's usually barely five feet tall, right. uh, weighing six 100 to, pounds. Six to 195, and you're the smallest guy in the boat. What was this, like a, 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 a Viking a <laughs> row ship? <laughs> Was there a guy? Was the cox and a guy with a drum just like boom? We, boom, we had it. Boom. We, we, we had a a, 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 a a Norwegian guy in the middle of the boat. The, the middle four seats is called the engine room, four out of the eight seats. Wow. And he was six, five, uh, probably 225, 230. And it's crazy. I can, I'll find a picture and I'll show you me standing next to uh, and another. And we'll find another excuse to, to show that. Maybe Insane. when we do the physics of rowing. I'll pull out one of my rowing pictures uh, cool. on the medal stand. Got a gold medal in that race. Um, anyhow, that, that was just one question. Why, why, why I know. Why did I blather right. on like that? Well, right. here's, here's, one, here's one that's a little more personal that you'll mm -hmm. help someone with. And this is the artist formerly known as James Smith. Um, hey, Neil, and I guess Chuck. Uh, <laughs> well, he doesn't always know that you're going to be the guy, but, but you are true. the guy. Okay. So he goes, I'm 37 from Indianapolis, and I have been wanting to return to school. I really love math and science. Is it too late for me to get into astrophysics or astronomy, or have the sands of time just run out on my cosmic scholarly journey? Oh. Thank you so much for all you guys do. Love, James. Okay. So, Let, what do you I think? think we're going to have to end with this question. It's a great question. So here you go. What I have come to learn, James is that as human life expectancy increases, the cutoff times also go up with it, if there's a cutoff time, time for anything. So there was a day when, you know, you, you know, why was the retirement age put at 65? Because that's when most people died. Go look at the actuarial, actuarial genius. <laughs> okay, let's, <laughs> let's go, go look at the actuarial tables from the 1930s. <laughs> Whenever they put in a 65-year retirement age, we were dying between and 65 no and 70. Collect. It's great. <laughs> There's no one to collect on the insurance. Right. So, so that that's how that played out. All right. And now people are not even retired, they're not leaving the job until they're 75. Look at old movies. 
how old was the person they considered old sitting in the corner? That person was in their 60s at, at, um, and at most 70. All right. I've watched old Twilight Zone episodes, black and white from the 50s and 60s. And the old person, the really old person in the nursing home is 72. So all I'm saying is if 50 years ago you used to be given up for debt at 72 and now you can go to 85, um, if you're 37, you've got at least another 40 years that takes you to 70, 40 years, 40 years. Look what people do between high school and graduate school uh, to get advanced degrees. They do that and then they're on the market by the time they're 30. You got plenty of years to do this. Just do it. Don't let anybody stop you. And we'll welcome you on the other side. Wow. And Chuck, I don't want to find your name in that list of Patreon members. Don't, oh, don't, no, that's don't a even, done deal. Don't even. <laughs> I'm si signing up right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Chuck. This is uh, Star Talk, Cosmic Queries, Patreon edition. Neil deGrasse Tyson, keep looking up. <laughs>